welcome to smileys today we are uh, doing our read along of forge of darkness by steven erickson and this is the summary episode for chapters 7 and 8 7 yep. and 8 yeah we are doing 7 and 8 today and spoilers will be spoilers for book of the fallen and novels of the malazan empire mhm and i'm mora and joining me is my co-host oh. lee who is Hello. preserving his voice because yeah. he has a few uh, chapters because these chapters are quite me. long yeah so <laughs> <clears throat> shall we of course so <clears throat> without further ado so chapter 7 begins with uh, spinak durav who is riding post haste to the forge and global fate uh start from his back is finar stone who is favored due to an infectious bite she is slipping in and out of consciousness as they ride When they arrive, Kanata Stane is there to receive them and informs them that Lord Ilgast Rand is present. We've seen that before. Uh, who is a capable healer in his own right. The latter, Finara, um, Finara is actually mortified at her fraught memories. Uh, her, uh, her witnessing fires last for death, the invasion from the Vitter, the undying demons that arose from that dread sea. Cannot command her to sleep because Elgast is going to heal her, and that is a painful process. And um, Elgast begins the process of healing as darkness is sent to take Finara. Now, as we've seen, along with Calat and Elgast are Hunral and Asurk. The captain, as he often does, is scheming because it's Hunral. Calat uh, has proclaimed his neutrality in the face of Finara's arrival, perhaps helped a little by Elgast's friend, but the warden's news portend new arrivals, and thus. new events to consider. Hustain's neutrality isn't necessarily a bad thing, because he is wedded to the commander of the Hust Legion, and so neutrality maintained by the Wardens will remove one potential enemy. Indeed, a resurrected Resigner's Legion would steamroll over any and all resistance put forth by the combined forces of ability. 7,000 professional soldiers would have no trouble facing down a few hundred houseblades if, if it came to that, And so, by force of will and arms, they'll install your Sander as Mother Dark's husband in the name of justice. Yeah, it makes makes perfect oh. sense. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Osirk cut in the Ral's thoughts, inquiring about the changes this portends to the plans. Uh, Hone informs him that he plans to ride to Gorkanas and inform the nobleborn of the new invasion, while Osirk rides back to Nerdsor to inform Father of the same. With any luck, your Sander will come to his own. Assume command of the Legion, and the wedding will be officiated. Draconis will be cast out, and the Legion will be reconstituted. Excuse me, reconstituted. Yeah. A Cirque is malleable, because it's a Cirque, uh, and goes along with it, but for the time being is instructed to maintain a low profile as his father's representative in an imminent meeting that will define much of their future moves. In the meantime, <laughs> Captain Shorina Sankaru has joined the company, and find something inspiring pathos in Kagamantra Tulas' self-abnegation in searching for his betrothed. In Shawinas' eyes, Tulas would rather die a noble hero than live in an unhappy marriage, and if that means riding after a fire hand into the unknown, it's a sacrifice he'd be willing to make. Along with the six other wardens? Because... Uh, that, that comes later. Oh. <laughs> to be fair, the guy would literally ride into his own if it came to that, so, you know, she's not no, no, terribly like... wrong. he would but he would also take these people who who don't really have a death wish so it's, it's the noble born this this is how they roll yeah. we'll, we'll get to that um but yeah uh ralph's three cousins meanwhile sarab savig and risp are courting yes they're courting shorinas yes. but <laughs> the latter has no time for the pathetic games and leaves to join tulsa's riding party to wit to witness Uh, before she leaves, she thinks in Spinak Durav, and you get the idea by now, everybody wants to bone Spinak Durav. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this comes up again in this chapter again, so just, again. I'm bringing yes, this yes, up yes, because yes. everybody yeah. wants to bring Spinak Durav. Bring? You get the I, just, I can't speak today. <laughs> anyway. Yes. We cut back to Ilgast and Kalat, having an actually rather deep conversation about the nature of Ilgast's sorcery. As his power grows, his illusions and delusions about it are torn down. He senses a hint of deliberation, a purpose behind the sources that he wields. Yeah. Essentially, Elgast gazed at the abyss, 
and is shocked and when he misses it back. Yeah, in a more yeah. literal sense than the actual yeah, quote. Yeah. Uh, and that makes the two of them uneasy, as though they are made lesser by the knowledge that the universe seems indifferent to them. Ilgas, however, is not one to give up so easily. The sensation he describes is known as a diced, described by a shake word, the null. We know that one. I, I got goosebumps when I read it the first time. Yeah. But the monks describe it as an ecstasy, a spiritual revelation before which they are rendered helpless. Rend does not like this, and so he would just <laughs> yeah. battle against this helplessness, seeking to yeah. understand, as if comprehension alone would help him in his battle. Due to the perhaps heaviness of the subject, the two of them change to a more merry subject, the inevitable corrosion and destruction of Kurul Galane by the Sea of Winter. Fun. Yeah. Finara spoke of an invasion from the sea. No ships are capable of plowing the Caustic Sea, and so whoever came from there swam across. And upon Gas sprouting, cannot reveal his frustration at the Vitter. They don't understand it, and can find no mention of it anywhere in their records. The only people who know about it either don't share their knowledge, like the Zathanai, or have destroyed it, like the Jagged. Yeah. Hustain actually seems to have a measure of respect for the Jagged and their dissolution of their civilization, a measure which Ren does not share. Uh, their rejection of the future, and especially the Lord of Hate's desire to stand still in time, Reeks of fatalism to Ilgas' tears, or a resignation to fate, if you will. Kalat is inclined to agree somewhat, especially with regards to how they treat the knowledge they amassed, a knowledge that Taist could indeed use. But alas, unless the Taist actively seek out the dragon in their solitary towers, scant little of their knowledge can prove useful to them. Upon mention of the Jack, Ilgas remarks that stupidity returns triumphant, and Kalat responds that Honral rides the Karkanas in the morning. <laughs> Yeah. Take that as we will. If, if you hadn't pointed, I wouldn't have noticed. You know, I, I took like four that. reads, and I just like I noticed because <laughs> the foot beneath that is like Ilgas just looks looked at, at him, him deadpan, and like, oh, what the yeah, fuck yeah. is this? Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that it's so easy to miss. Yeah. So, the scene changes to probably my favorite part of the chapter, which is um, Farrer and Trace writing. Yeah. Oh, so. yeah. This gets uh, fairly deeply philosophical fairly quickly because, surprise, writing into the nothingness tends to inspire philosophical thought in the taste. So, <laughs> as Mora would put it, uh, Farrah is writing and she thinks. Yeah, yeah. When you move, you think. If you stand no. still, you don't think. Yeah. Exactly. So Triss is actually quite uh, fascinated by the world around her, especially this water Farrah is speaking of, and gets very deeply philosophical in a particularly alien way. Uh, Farrer speaks of a spring nearby, commanded by outlaws and deserters, and probably deniers, and warns Triss of the possibility that they may be set upon by them, though, looking at Triss' assortment, she remarks that they may have caused hesitate. I wonder why. <laughs> Upon Farrer's inquiry, the woman begins making strange remarks about dreams. And, okay, I can, I can drop the facade, right? You know who this is? You know who this is. I know who yeah. this is. We all yeah, know who this obviously. is. With spoilers, uh, oh. because of all it. So. so, the Queen of Dreams, in any case, makes certain interesting <laughs> remarks about the Witter. Yeah. She calls it an excess of vitality, and uh, dreams within the Witter are unpleasant. Now, this excess of vitality bit is interesting, because later down the line, she brings up that the Witter only destroys. Yeah, yeah, and that didn't track, right? That didn't track, and we'll get to that in the actual discussion later, but a lot of what Triss says here is wrong. Like, factually wrong. Mm -hmm. But we'll get there. Factually, yeah. We have facts. Yeah. We have facts and we have facts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's facts and facts. So, uh, in this world, unlike the Vitter, uh, for one to create, one must first destroy. It is the nature of the world for its inhabitants to dwell amidst destruction. And I think Mora mentioned this, that this was um, a description no. of entropy, which is... Interesting. I just turned yellow again. God damn it. One sec. Good. Good. Each time you disagree with me, I hope you turn yellow. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Well. God damn. It. Okay. This is not. <laughs> this is not going. This, we're gonna have to bear with us. Forgive me. So, um, Farrer then proceeds to ask Triss if she came with a purpose, because she considers Triss to be a harbinger, to present some sort of lesson or meaning upon the dice. 
then Pris asks the same. Do you have a purpose here? Do the Thais have knowledge of their purpose beforehand? Pharaoh makes an attempt for a warden and a drav to make sense of all of this and responds that one comes to discover the things one must do in a life. Upon further challenge, though, she relents. Not everything that one does is their purpose in life because nobody truly knows what their purpose is. It seems that not even the Thais have answered the question of why are we here. They ask it of the abyss, and the only response is the echo of their own cries. And though Farah believes that there are many meanings, they have yet to find a true answer, if there is one, which Steve was not going to tell you there is one, to the question they seek. Triss, alas, is in no position to argue such points, because she doesn't remember shit. Um, and also, interestingly, she seems to actively forget things in the short term, though a few chapters ago, she recognized the word Zathanai, as that yeah. to, to yeah, yeah. something Zathanai, the people who are never born. Here, nada. <laughs> uh, so, fire reasons, then, that some force is trying to keep Triss from remembering things, because she's dangerous. And so she elects to ride with her to Corcanus. Triss offhandedly remarks that the Vitter is the Tite's enemy, which shocks her, which is, and it's only uh, reminiscent of Ilgast and Kalasa discussion about nature having a will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so Fire thinks that maybe Triss isn't a harbinger come from the Vitter, but the truth of the Vitter incarnate. Farrer enters such a spiral of thoughts, uh, following his remark. Maybe Glimmerfate is itself a forlorn hope of the sea, devouring the land ahead in an endless quest of corrosion for its own survival. Though that would perforce mean that the Vitter is in and of itself not cognizant of its own shortcomings, and to ascribe to it a measure of intelligence and call it the Tyst's enemy is not quite correct. And so, why is Triss here? If she is to be the messenger of an uncaring, indifferent, unthinking natural force, fair reasons, is that not in and of itself an oxymoron? What need does the Vitter have for a messenger? It delivered so message just fine. It's, I don't care about you. I will continue. <laughs> the I mean, only thing that like, has changed I'm, in the century... Yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry, it's like, it's like making a joke saying that I'm ignoring you, but I'm going to ignore you harder by sending <laughs> someone there to <laughs> ignore you more. Maybe. Uh, but then, Fire thinks further, and the only thing that has changed in the centuries that the Thais have been aware of Glimmer Fate in the, in the Sea of Vitter is Triss. She is the only thing that's different. And Fire cannot make any sense of it. So before I uh, move on, because I'm orange again, before I move on, because they get to the spring now and they start having a few interesting different conversations, um, yeah. This happened. <laughs> what? So yeah, we're doing spoilers always steeper for this, right? So we have seen the Vitter before. Yeah. Uh, we, we have, have seen, seen a small pool of Vitter. We have seen a pool, pool of Vitter. Um, which, by the way, is cool because like, she has come from the Vitter. And the, it's, it, it's these little details that are really cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I like it so um, much, yeah. But what do we know of the Vitter? It erodes everything. It's toxic. It has fumes that will, you know, make you sick and all that. I don't know how they kept a pool inside a temple. I don't know either. We should ask. We should ask Steve. Actually, we should ask both of them. Actually, we should ask both of them. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. the point I'm trying to make here is that the very few times we have seen the Vitter outside of the Forge of Darkness, it is almost always in conjunction with a force of creation, be it in the swords of creation or thenas, which means gift of creation. And I think uh, when asked by AP, Cam basically said that it represents an endless flux, which is exactly what Triss describes here. Right? To create, one must first destroy. That is what the Vitter is describing. That is what the Vitter represents. So oh. Triss later saying it only destroys is wrong, and she should know this. So, it's an interesting question to ask of why doesn't she know? Like you said, <clears throat> something is like um, 
blocking her memory. So she remembers only some things. So, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, I agree, but we can't elaborate further because spoilers. In any case. Yeah. Um, so the two of them ride on regardless, onward to the spring in question, and Fire advises caution. Triss asks if she should raise an army of clay and grass. Upon further questioning, we learn that she has fashioned the sword with which to slay the wolves and chop her hair with, <laughs> yes, though she has important. no memory of ever seeing one. Her memory thus must be flawed, as we just discussed. So, what power does Triss draw upon? Does it come from the Vitter? As we just mentioned, the woman responds that the Vitter, unlike this world, does not create it but destroys. It assailed Triss, and she could only think of the struggle itself, and that struggle consumed all that she was. So, Triss does not necessarily remember much. But her discussion with fire has given her much to think about, and so she reasons that wherever her power comes from, it delivers pain upon the world, and so she would rather not use it. Yeah. Fire then believes that traces of Athenai, bingo, nailed it, yeah. <laughs> uh, come to wage war against the bitter, instead of being a harbinger of the bitter, and in the ensuing struggle, has lost much of herself. That would then imply that Triss has her own is here of her own volition, and indeed has created her own purpose and meaning. And do you see where I'm going with this? I think you see where I'm going with this. No, no, I don't really. Okay. Um, is I'll it is it going to be spoilers or? No, no, it's just um. The quote, the struggle itself, is from a you know the myth of Sisyphus from Camille, and yeah, basically. Right. Yeah. They spoke, yeah. I need they that, spoke, yeah. Yeah. Okay. They spoke of meaning earlier, and like Trace is here, like saying, "I make my own meaning. See, no one controls me. I'm free. Look yeah, at me." So... Except, we'll get to that again in a second. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Yeah. So the two enter the trail and come up on the spring, finding a troop which Fanner believes is either of Merit Sor or of the Yan Monastery. Uh, indeed, the spring reeks of blood and death. A troop of Yan Sheik set upon the Alice on the spring and killed them all to the last man, woman, and child. Great. Yeah. Two of the monks approach, Lieutenant Kaplow Dream and Warlock Resh, to take custody of Triss. Kaplow makes a less than subtle insinuation that had Farrah arrived here the day before, should be the sport of little boys by now. Great guy, Kaplow is. He, he's, he's a very subtle guy, no? Kaplow? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, between the two of them, they seem to support quite the kill count because they're both wielding weapons that are covered in blood. Yeah. Kaplo is a sickly pale man, uh, while Rash is built like a brick outhouse. Uh, neither of them are particularly pleasant individuals, and the Digesis makes sure you get that. The sight spells death to each of the observer's senses. Rush and Kaplow assume custody of the Azathenai and inform Farrah that she is being tracked down by 50 wardens per Colonel Hastain's orders, including her betrothed. Triss bids Farrah farewell, ensuring her that she, should she grow bored, she will simply seek out Mother Dog herself, because of course she will. Yes, yes. Kaplow tries to soothe matters, to little avail. There's more than a little tension between the warden and the sheikh, I wonder why. And though Farrah inevitably relents after questioning them about the whereabouts of her betrothed and of Nara Stone, the place still reeks of death, and so she would rather not stay any longer. Rash claims that he will quell, excuse me, he will quell all despairing spirits, and so none of them will suffer any drawbacks. And then Twist cuts in that they won't suffer any drawbacks despite all the blood in their hands. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Triss has some singers in this. I Triss, guess this like, absolutely nails them. It's glorious. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so, Triss then, la uh, shedding her garments, enters the water and, well, capital gapes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. In the meantime, after uh, Triss bathes, Fire takes a place outside, and she seems to like neither Capolo nor Resh. I can't imagine why. They're such pleasant individuals. 
she does remain somewhat undecided on Capital Dream because she is a bit unreadable, but Resh is a bully, both in appearance and demeanor. And Farrer has had her fill of such people, especially being a warden. Now, Triss, after her bath, joins her for tea and the two talk. Because, of course. So, the Azath and I has a rather curious inquiry. Um, do these monks abjure women? Yeah. Um, Farrer replies that some do, but their traditions are more complicated than just that. Each monk is life-bound to another mate in the opposite monastery. Yan are the sons of the mother, and the Yadan are daughters of the father. Note that we get different translations in the Book of the Fallen. I mean, we don't get different translations, we get like the opposite. Not exactly. How would Yadan be the daughters and Yan be the sons? Because... Or Yan is the name of the mother and Yadan is the name of the father. No. I... Well, let's go. Sure, we'll get to that. Yeah, sure. So, um, the monks may lie with whomever they wish. They can live apart their entire lives. But when they pass, they are buried together. No god has ordained them to do so. But Farrah is unsure for their details beyond the martial ability of the Sheikh. And so, through that trigger, Triss and Farrah engage in a conversation about the nature of civilization. Fun. Yeah. So, Farrah claims that it's not but crowd control, a means to keep people constrained, loyal, and subjugated. Laws are by nature oppressive. I wonder who said that before. I don't know. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard this before. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. We only they are bring meant it up like every yeah. week. I mean, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, so yeah, laws are by nature repressive and they're meant to keep people muzzled. Civilization declines when those who repeatedly break said laws with impunity and they're not punished. And I'm sure that cannot be foreshadowing for the future. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Not important. Yeah. So um turns out that Fire's parents were scholars that were brutally murdered during a raid by the Jellings during the wars, and no wonder she doesn't have a particularly high opinion of civilization. As such, Farrah fled such knowledge, and now fights to defend an ephemeral nation that... Uh, no. yeah. She fights to defend an ephemeral a notion, not mm-hmm. nation, I'm stupid, that she, at the most base level, disagrees with. She is cognizant of the fact that before viciousness and ignorance and savageness, there can be no defense. And that civilization is an incomplete defense at that. Before this tirade of nihilism, the Azathanai asks about the pleasures of life, to which Farrah responds that though they're both ephemeral, one must enjoy them while they last. Pleasantries yeah. to end the day. The uh, in the meantime, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this particular scene ends there, yes. Yeah, so she says they drink, uh, you know, you should just drink deep and it cuts to black. Do you think, do you think, no? Do I like, think? Let, let's, no, no, let's, let's no, I don't think. They, good, they think good. of tea. Very good. Yeah, they're just drinking tea, sure. What is Kaplow and Rish talking about? This is something I think you had fun summarizing. So oh, yeah. Let's hear it. Fun. <laughs> yeah. So, Kaplow and, um, Kaplow and Rish have this interesting dynamic in which they talk in the weirdest fucking imaginable way. <laughs> they talk basically only in metaphors uh, in ways that only they understand. Yeah. There's alliteration and there's like they complete one another's sentences. And it's super fucking annoying because I don't understand what they're saying. So It's not annoying. It's so fun. <laughs> go on, go on. I want to see. Yeah. So, in the meantime, Capolo and Resh are arguing, but not quite, in the manner they often do, which is, as I said, infuriatingly difficult to summarize. So, these two are scheming to earn the grace of Mother Dark by taking Trace into her midst, but Resh is somewhat skeptical, because he isn't stupid. Uh, Capolo is much better prepared, uh, and has singled out the three questions that need to be answered before they can move on. What threat does Tris pose? What good will it do them if they warn the ties of said threat? And what does her desire to visit Mother Dark mean for them? Resh is uh, somewhat uninspired and unimpressed by his companion, who is a slippery eel of a bastard. 
Uh, but capital continues that everybody makes assumptions of their neutrality, and assumptions that, according to Resch, shall prove accurate, but assumptions nonetheless. And that offends Capelo. Yes, they are most likely going to stay neutral if all things are the same, but will all things stay the same? And, by the way, I should note that this is a like simplification of the matter, because they speak of this as though, like, the shake are a nest on a tree, and that tree <laughs> is curled galane, and then there's, like, the tree... And its roots, which are new, like it's it's on a branch. Yeah? These people yeah. don't talk like human beings. I swear to God, they, like no one talks like this. No, they're not humans. They're ties. Okay, you get the point. Yes, yes. Sorry, go go on. So, oh, I'm going to like dumb down a little bit the <laughs> metaphors, which might lose some of the point, but I'm going to try to get the point across. Right. So, uh, Resh is a bit split on the matter. On the one hand, he wants to usher in Triss to the Citadel simply to see, see her stare shit and bask in the fallout. On the other hand, Triss is an Asathanai whose power is much greater than each of the Sheikh. He then goes on a long tangent, continuing the metaphor of the Sheikh monsters as the nest, that essentially expresses his concerns. The magic within Triss is much too powerful for them to reasonably control, but it's not Mother Dark that's in danger here, it's them, and I'm sure that's not foreshadowing either. Um, Kaplo, alas, yeah. does not give a shit because he's dumb. And so the conversation shifts to fire. Um, and remember what I said in the start? How everybody <laughs> wants to bone Spinak Drav? Yeah, apparently even yeah. fucking Warlock Crash wants to bone Spinak Drav. <laughs> and um, yeah. and go, apparently not. I don't. I think he's uh, he names him too winning for his tastes, whatever that means. Yeah, because but. it's our grapes. He was rejected, so he thinks, oh, I don't, I don't like him anyway. So right. Yeah. Uh, so, the two of them also seem cognizant of the warden's indifference to her betrothed, uh, no matter how hard he seems to try. Capelo concludes that Teresa's presence here isn't aligned to Ferrer, and she's present for her own purposes. Wow. Uh, <laughs> though she's not perhaps as capable as other Zathanai, a notion that Resh admittedly laughs at. I mean, look at the horse she's made and what it pretends. No, is Kaplo, it... Is it... Do you much. want to say the yeah. exact words? <laughs> I don't remember the exact words. <laughs> Look at the horse. It was, it was something pretty... pretty it was like, yeah. Uh, uh, um, Preuse pre your horse. Oh, your yeah, horse. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, some such. <laughs> that is fun. I don't know, I mean, but I didn't get the whole uh, thing about, you know, she's not a mason and there are uncarved words. Are they talking about like Tulas getting married to Farrah and That's the one thing, yeah. When they mentioned mm -hmm. the... the Flowing wards on a stone mantle and whatnot to a two last in the car, but then they shift back to because Asath and I are famed masons and not much else, but Trace is just like a 20 year old boyish yeah. girl. And so, um, Trace has not a mission's talent nor one's stolid comportment. You think not, but use your not horse, think not too hard on it, lest your pallor grow yet more sickly. If that is even possible. Have you? <laughs> Since I never you heed your words, Resh, I will in fact give it further thought. But not now. All this killing has made me sleepy. Like, fuck this guy. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like, have you been listening to the audiobook? Is that why you're making voices now? No, I haven't actually, but this is how I imagine Capo <laughs> speaks. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, this guy is dumb. I'm gonna get out of there. He's just dumb. You know what? Like Farrer, I didn't know what to think of Kaplow because obviously I forgot it. But <laughs> now that you mention it, yeah, I'm going to start judging him that he's go he's pretty dumb. So he's very like okay, he is very full of himself. He's very arrogant, and he has he's full of hubris. I mean, at some point, like Resh says that um because of course he speaks that way. Shakanto would lather you in grease, throw you into the citadel, <laughs> and watch where you slip out, and that gives you purpose in life. Like. This dude is just <laughs> fuck off. I, I actually like the one part where he says something like, uh, "You know, you stand firm on all sides of the argument." <laughs> yeah, yeah. He is prone to pettiness. I, you are political. I just said that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, see, it was fun. I don't know why you were so annoyed during the uh, summarizing it's like... thing. Because I had to decode the metaphor and then present it in a summarizable way, which is not easy. You should just, you should just ignore the metaphor and summarize. 
Okay. Metaphors are for reading and enjoying it. When you're summarizing, you don't need the crutch. You just need the information. No? Right. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh-huh. I'm being told a hound, so... Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Ask me. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Good point. So, yeah. Um. So, the screen changes completely. We're back to Glimmer Fate with uh, Sharina's and Kagamato's party, who is riding hard with Lissa the lead, almost to the point of killing their horses. Lissa's obsession sends Sharina's down a spiral of thinking about death, unlike Krill Durav from previous chapters, and she basically destroys Sagander's thought process from chapter 5 completely. How is it that Pai's lives are worth more than horse lives, or any other sentient life for that matter? Death is universal, she'd seen as much, and yet the Taist would insist of their own inherent superiority. She wouldn't have that. When Tumla's next moves to take up the reins, she snaps at him, and he stops. Uh, Sharina's countless patients, they're here to find Farrer, yes, but they're also here to confirm Venara's story. And if Farrer is indeed dead, then no pace is going to spare her life, and her remains aren't going anywhere. A warden named Bered cuts in and confirms more or less what Sharina is saying. They understand Tulas' insistence to find the betrothed, but Farrer is their companion, and not only is Farrer not going anywhere if she's dead, but they also have to conserve their horses in case shit goes sideways. And they're in the vitter, so it might. Yeah. Tulas concedes, and Sharina notes that the man is almost taking a sort of grim satisfaction from self-sacrifice. I'm sure this won't come up again. Actually, it does. Like, immediately. <laughs> because Tulas is actually one smart bastard. He knows that Serena's nose and immediately cuts the chase. Farrer is his reward for his service in the wars. There is no love between them, he knows. But he will not deprive Farrer Hand of a life of pleasure for his own selfish ambitions. He will do what he needs to do, but he has no expectations in return. Serena calls him a fool. The man would give his life in Farrer's defense without even looking at her and counters by saying that Tuas is in turn Farrer's reward. She had no choice in the matter, because her bloodline is decimated during the wars, and she needs to produce heirs. Oh boy. Um, and even a depressed, dead-inside husk of a man can still produce heirs. So, Tuas, by I, means of self-sacrifice... Can I, say, yes? can I just say, people should leave off Tuas. The poor man. He just looks sad, and everyone starts, you know... Pouncing on him. Just leave him alone. He's he's fine. I I, I find it so hard. I'm I'm waiting for his POV actually. I want to see you know, does all these things match to what he thinks? Everyone hates him. Poor Tulas. There is like a stark difference between the dead inside the Tulas here to like the you are returned to this world so gas, which leads me to the insurmountable conclusion that the Azath do indeed know how to shit in the crippled god. What? What? That's a genuine quote. And then they go on talking about orgies. Like, yeah, yeah. There there's a very is. different Tula Shorn in Tall the Hounds of the Crippled God compared to here. All of them Silkus, Tulas, and Skara. Skara Bandaris. They're all so. <sighs> what what do you see? One sec. Yeah. We'll just yeah, accept okay. it. Yeah. Sick. So. Um, <clears throat> though. As I've mentioned, Kagamandra isn't stupid. If Sharina wishes to be blunt, he'll be blunt in return. He can more or less sense that Sharina isn't here because of any altruistic reasons, but that openness is exactly what causes her to open up to him in return. She admits that she's more here mostly because she found the pathos of his betrothal interesting in a cruel manner, but Kagamandra deserves better than that. Thank you. And so she offers up an olive branch of friendship. To her surprise, he readily accepts, and then again, he immediately wastes no time in cutting the chase. Civil war is coming. Will Serena side with Eurasander? Yeah. They have an interesting digression about time. Tuas concludes that the, the Taist are hoarders of time's wealth and worshippers of its waste. Serena observes that he's spent a good part of his life since the war preparing to die. A waste, most assuredly. The digression quickly ends and they return to the matter at hand. Sharinas, as we've seen, is pretty keenly aware of Hunral's bullshit and took glorious satisfaction, you and me both, in seeing Khan Hussein simply ignore the captain. <laughs> Tulas, who is yet more keen at Sharinas, which says a lot, 
uh, knows that most of Hastain's denial came from advice from Elgast, and so the camp are drawn. Elgast and Hastain on one side, and Hunral and his posse on the other. Which side will she choose? Shireen has believed that her relatives, one being Infane Menan, who's her sister, and the other being Tath Lord, who's her cousin. Oh, do you know the difference between who's a sister and who's a cousin? Yes. Good. I cheated, Good. I looked it up. No. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's not really important. But I figured I'd mention it. So yeah, Manan is her sister, Tath Lord's her cousin. Sure. Which makes it Thanks. a bit interesting because like the three sisters are actually sisters. We're not gonna get into that no, now. Not. No, thanks. Thank you. So uh, these three will probably side with Ral if only to stick it to Draconis. Whereas Tulas claims that he will side with peace. Tulas then brings up a paradigm with regards to Draconis. The Jalek often the Jalek, Jalek, I think, uh, mm. often slay the pups of their rivals because they despise the lover of their mother. Sharinas then observes that the tie is too much the same and call it war. When the veil is gone, indeed, war is scant little more than what Tulas has described. Speaking of, Tulas' assertion that he will side with peace is met by a challenge. Everyone is saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Tulas, though, knows that most of that is smoke and mirrors, or in more proper terms, bullshit. The Tigers assert that they fight for peace, while at the same time plotting violence out of the basest of motives, like envy. The two ride on, but the day's light is fading, and Barrett calls a halt for the group to share a meal. And I'm not sure if this is important, like, is it, like, I don't know. Maybe just because we were talking about it last time about how the border swords share yeah. meals and stuff. I don't know if this is important. It's just, I don't know. Anyway. I mean, pause. We'll, we'll know if this scene comes back in the next chapters. Like, is this mm. time for character work? We'll find out. We'll draft for. Come on. Come on. <clears throat> Stay orange. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. Okay. Well. Next. So, following the meal, the wardens ride out to the shore of the Witcher Sea. The place is unsettling because the remains of Funara's horse are still there, as is the corpse of whatever killed it, and they approach with utmost caution. Further along, there seems to be a boulder of sorts within the Fitter Sea, which never happens, and for good reason, which Barrett is understandably unhappy about. They, for some reason, approach to investigate, and Sharinas believes it to be a ship, though she's never seen a ship up close. She has only seen it in uh, four looking illustrations, which she considers to be embellished. Mm. Mm. Yeah, why? No, I'm just saying. The four can have ships, but the dice don't. Really? Why not? Mm. Mm. I, anyway. I, I, I don't know what you're insinuating. I'm not really. I'm just curious because, like, I don't. Borders aren't drawn on the map, but just like, this is Kurl Galane. Yeah. They're, cool. they're not leaving Kralgalane, they're just staying there. As they ride even closer, they finally note what the thing, the boulder, is. It's a creature born of legend, with thin wings made of sailcloth, or looking like so. It's a membrane. But Serena thinks it looks like sailcloth, which she hasn't seen before. <laughs> I don't know why Serena is making ship. I don't know why Serena is making ship parallels here, I swear, honestly. <laughs> But anyway, I I don't care. It's it's a nice image to have. That you think <laughs> oh it's yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So whatever this thing is, it was once named after a winged lizard that had dwelt in the Blackwood, a creature. You say winged lizard, and all I can think of is Ryzen, yeah, the Seven Cities thing, yeah. Which might be an evolutionary like, I don't know what the word is. You know, this might be an evolutionary ancestor of the Ryzen, maybe. Or it could be the same. Who knows. Well, that thing, that little Somebody thing is called might Elaine. Uh, sorry? Maybe. That little thing, the lizard thing, is called Elaine. Yeah. And then they named the bigger, like, ten times the size of a normal Tyst thing, also Elaine. Which is cute. Right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, apparently, <clears throat> Elaine, dragons, had come forth to greet Mother Dark when she called towards the chaos when she sat atop the Sparrow Bandy. Whatever that means. Yeah. Yeah. So, Barrett, understandably, again, tells Sharinas to get out of Dodge. Sharinas, again, utmost caution, uh, wishes to examine the beast, 
but does consider the possibility that it might still be alive. Well, that's a plus. As she approaches the beast, she notices that its abdomen area is completely eviscerated and lacerated. Near to it, she finds a discarded set of acid-eaten armor, along with clothing, and a similarly acid-eaten sword. Yeah. Yeah. And before the chapter ends, Sharina's wonders aloud, Farrer Hand, who walks with you now? Yeah, because she sees the footprints. I mean, they notice. That I'm fucking like... orange again. Okay. And yeah, you can probably tell what this portends. For... What this meant. I don't know what it portends. It means that she came from the winter. That's all. <clears throat> Either she used it to travel or she was eaten by something and somehow managed to escape. I don't know. <laughs> this is a good log summary. Yep. Um... Because the next yeah. one is also for similar long, we're gonna stop here and um, we're not gonna discuss anything too important here. We're gonna jump to the summary straight up, right? I think so. So, chapter eight, yeah, we are back to my favorite people. There is Hout, 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 and Korea. So, they get ready to go on this journey because you know, suddenly they decide that they have to go somewhere. Uh, he's picking out some weapons. He's laid out a whole array of all sorts of weapons and he calls them all arguments in iron. Yeah, his arguments. Yeah, they're all arguments. So ultimately he picks like this uh, Telakai axe, a huge one. But Korea is not allowed any weapons. She asks him why and all that. And yeah. She is armed eventually, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, after she asks, she, he tells that, you know, maybe you can just pick a ladle. <laughs> so anyway, the two uh, get ready. Then Hout opens the door and all the, uh, you know, they're like surrounded by uh, some kind of swirls of some magical thing happens. And... Oh, 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 I get to go with this again. What? What is it? There's so much symbolism in this chapter. Is it? <clears throat> I mean... Well, let's, let's see. Please I mean, it's, do you, would you call it symbolism? It's like so, so blatant, so... Like, no? Okay. Anyway, they open the door and there is a narrow trail which is like covered in wealth and on all sides there is like something like chaos. So she asks like where are they going and I'm not going to look at you. How to sense that you know something has awakened in the south and so he wants to talk to other jagged people and <clears throat> sorry and then he says that we don't really talk or we dis or discuss like jagged we only argue. And Korea says she doesn't like mysteries <laughs> or riddles. And all he says is, that's too bad. And then she wants to know, like, who has left behind all this treasure? You know, it must have great value. Like, enough to beggar a king or something. And he says, well, is it rarity that gives value to something? Then that means that, <clears throat> you know, more than these trinkets, there are... Pause? No, no, go on. <clears throat> that more than these kind of trinkets... What is more rare are things like trust, truth, integrity, etc. And the greatest of all is like what? An outstretched hand, right? So this is wealth and not these trinkets on our, on our path. And then he says that this is the most, uh, be ready with your arms. This is the most treacherous path and we must walk it with unerring step, child. So. Symbolism. Korea guesses that you know, this whole place is Azathanai. And then he wonders what the Thais are going to do with this soul-taken pups. You know, they've taken as hostages now. The the Jalak hostages. I don't know how news spreads in this area, but anyway, he knows. And then she says that, you know, I mean, he, he says that they can't be tamed. Because if you have to tame something, you're going to take advantage of their stupidity. And the Jalak are not exactly stupid. And that is something the Thais are going to find out soon. Right? That's what, that's what how it thinks. I really don't know if that happens or not. Anyway, they keep walking, and as they walk, all they have to do is think. Korea starts thinking about her dolls and how they're all confined to this trunk, and she didn't even like leave them out on a window or something. No, you ready? You ready? <laughs> ready with your? <laughs> so anyway, and then for some reason, she thinks of these uh, dead flies stuck in her window. My God. 
all of a sudden and then she has like another childhood memory of when you know she used to go on hunts with her taist people and they used to cure these jellex skins and then she realizes that these are like people they're not just animals and <laughs> and she feels so so shocked by all the, the way people have been behaving and then how it teaches her some history like he says that in the assembled form the jellex resemble the dog runners from deep south and in deep south there is a branch of jellex called jack and and then she says that you know the taist used to hunt them for pleasure and he says that you know every civilization has this thing where they take they make marine killing and you know, basically in slaughter and at some point they have to reach some kind of restraint and that is a measure of a civilization and at one point jacket were also a civilization but now they decided to stop marching forward you know so they ended their civilization and since she has realized this information about taist he wants to know what she is going to do with this you know is she going to spit it or swallow it which it just makes so much sense to me you know like she she's a child and this is the way he is teaching her that what are you going to do with this distasteful information it's 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 great and even then she says that you know if possible i would just walk away from civilization and he says you know that's not possible because it is something which is within you Yeah, go, go on, you, you, sorry, 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 sorry. And <laughs> and you know all these weapons, uh, which are arguments in iron, they all decide these questions that come up in a civilization. Are, are you interrupting me or? No, no, no. I'm just trying to. Don't worry about it. Just go on. <clears throat> You're doing color correction. Yeah, pretty much. Trying to get sure. the focus properly. <laughs> Honestly, it just keeps auto focusing the background, and it like turns me orange. Yeah. uh and then he says that you know she is going to live forever and in each age she is going to see echoes of the same sentiment you know the arguments in iron sentiments and she says no no that's not possible because even gods don't live forever and he wants to know what do you know about gods and that's when she thinks that she was a goddess once to her dolls you know not to people and she has abandoned them in the trunk instead of at least you know giving them a proper place to look outside or something like that and then she's not sure that if these memories are hers right of seeing these dead flies and seeing those flies taking flight and now she thinks that you know she's flying in front of her window and she even has this memory of being an old woman who yearns for a child's dream so because we're talking about a child's dream i think we can safely cut to feren who oh, it is this chapter right yeah feren is still grieving her still born son like she had a still birth and you know the, the whole thing starts with children died and mothers cope or something like that so she has very vivid memory it's trauma basically and she's never processed it uh, she can still hear like some youth outside the hut who were like laughing at an uh, you know insensitively because they didn't know and someone has scolded them and made them stop she can still hear their insensitive laughter you know and she can also see rent uh, being sad because the child is still born anyway she has been sleeping with arathan and she is trying not to do any contraception because she wants to get pregnant she did not even take any measure when she slept with grizzin grizzin scores and uh, you know and for some reason i thought that you know this this part where uh, there is there, it's almost like galan telling us that she is stealing the life of others of like you know by giving birth to a bastard child no i did felt very outside the narrative it was not just her thinking that if she continues on this path and has a bastard son she is almost stealing the life from that child and she is just using arathan to get a son out of him and this is a bit of commentary i don't think she is going to say that there is a recklessness to women and uh, because she stopped caring that she is a dangerous woman now and all that anyway it ends with children died but a woman could make more children okay moving on rent <clears throat> is filled with dread and hatred and worry and some <laughs> they're passing through these uh, ruins which you know if you finish this chapter and you're listening you know that these are mostly telakai dwellings and then he thinks about the past and how it has no beginning do you know why he starts thinking now any idea because he's riding okay yeah and how you know in yes. the past 
there is no beginning and it can never really be empty and because he's thinking about these ruins he starts thinking about the past of his sister who has you know twisted her thinking with regards to this young man and arathan is in his age of foolishness right so he by now he probably has deathless love and desire and everything for her and very soon it's going to turn into some kind of wounded hatred mhm so the riding and he keeps turning back looking for will and galak one there is still no sign of them so they are going to reach the azathanai settlements right and he wonders why would anyone from the azathanai welcome drak like how does he even know grizzin and draconis has obviously stayed in gural kural galen all his life so obviously why would any yeah obviously everyone knows that so why would the azathanai welcome him anyway they decide to camp at this one site where there are like three similar looking buildings all ruined of course and there's not enough water Get ready. There's not enough water because Draconis made a mistake and he thought this settlement would be occupied. The whole thing looks like it's been abandoned for centuries at least. So, <laughs> and I think later down, later down we see Raskan or somebody saying that maybe Grizzinfall gave you wrong information. You know, nobody thinks that Draconis could be wrong by himself, right? The dice are fucking dense. Who knew? Dense. <laughs> so anyway. <clears throat> Oh, you're not. You're not. You didn't really worry about the lack of water thing because you should. You should. Yeah, you should pay attention. So anyway, it's been uh, in this abandoned place, and then he says that you know, don't worry. The next day by noon, we are going to reach this river, which is a perennial river, and we're going to get enough water there. And among all of them, the two people who are not concerned about the lack of water are the horny ones, Feren and Arathan, and Raskan sees. <clears throat> I mean I oh I should have said thirsty once I I missed that out. shit missed opportunity yeah yeah anyway Raskan sees uh, Draconis wandering around the ruins and you know the group has more or less split into two and they're riding there is father and son in the front brother and sister in the back and Raskan in the middle and he's not even like a bridge between them he's just all by himself and that's why he has time to think all these things <clears throat> because he's trying right now they're not riding sorry oh they're, they're not camp. riding okay yeah, yeah they're in a camp but still he thinks you know very unusual mm. <clears throat> you know to switch things up so even he is also worried like basically everyone is worried about feren the way she is using the boy except except arathan obviously and he <laughs> he is waiting for when draconis is going to like intercede and he sees that you know uh, there there is a weakness in her which he did not notice before in that border sword and then finally draconis tells him that these ruins were attacked by jelek long ago and he also tells him these two you know draconis and raskan decide that you know it's time that artha needs warning to be to stay away from feren and raskan start saying that you know it's natural zeal on this boy's part and all that and draconis <laughs> immediately counters no no there is nothing unnatural in her zeal you know it could be zeal on his part but feren is not being you know normal here and you know because the ties are so long lived it's like 40 is not too old for her she can still have children for decades to come but raskan thinks that you know the older the mother gets what it diminishes is her capacity to love a child which is this is so tied i i can't even begin <laughs> right and then uh, he he wonders that maybe that's why she is so impatient to have a child and draconis doesn't accept such things because he's not one to embrace delusions because they offer comfort any any fan boy going on there i don't know anyway they decide to you know divide this dirty work raskan is going to take arathan and draconis is going to talk to feren cut to arathan what is he doing he is completely smitten like you have something no no okay i just found the quote and just go some like um Which one? he could not take his eyes off her she had become his vortex around which is vortex. you get the idea the, the yeah guys. that's what i've written she is his vortex and everything revolved around her and oh this is pretty gross he wishes he could like vanish and meld into her and look out through her eyes I'm and sure wouldn't even miss the street of what is having anything is it foreshadowing something i'm not going to say anything i thought make a note make a note for the discussion <clears throat> and then he wonders like you know maybe this is what love means and he still has all the weights packed for sagander yes he still has those weights and then 
uh, you know there are uh, i think I, i mentioned this before when i was reading this chapter that some of his thoughts here are like i'm 14 and this is deep kind of thoughts because <laughs> Sorry, I'm so sorry. But he is, oh he is so young and sheltered, so it, it makes sense. But it's pretty annoying. He Poor thinks how... Poor guy gets sassed. Yeah? Poor guy gets sassed. <clears throat> he's, he's very young. I mean. So anyway, he thinks something like the sky is so vast and the nature is so wild and things like that. And he remembers playing in sand as a child and grasping the sand in his fingers. And, you know, that is the meaning of war because if more than one hand reaches out for the same thing, then the blood will be spilled but the sand remains the same regardless of who is trying to claim it you know so the whole war everything is irrational just like desire so on right anyway thankfully thankfully raskan comes and drags him away that let's go for a walk and let's have a talk and arathan notices that he's wearing draconis's uh, moccasins because maybe it has some special value to him he doesn't even wear it like all day only in the evenings <clears throat> i don't i don't understand why so once they are uh, far enough away raskan is pretty straight forward he says you're not going to marry her you'll never be with her she's twice your age and she has twice your needs etc and arathan just says you know maybe we should have got more women and you're just jealous so <laughs> yeah yeah maybe maybe he has a point yeah so maybe. raskan says <clears throat> he's ready uh, i mean raskan is ready for all these things he says that she's not a whore and so she doesn't think like one and this you know this actually sort of blew my mind that what pace when when a coin is exchanged between a man and a whore and all that like what does it pay for actually it pays for no hard feelings which i'm i'm so shocked to think about it i i, I can't disagree with it can you i can't disagree with it so <clears throat> i'm Well, obviously, we said that this case brought up a lot of full of light in other episodes, but I've been reading uh, The Darkness That Came Before, yeah, which is book one of uh, The Bunch of Nothing. And I know Nef has told you before that basically every woman character is a whore. Yeah. Um, every, in the sense, the two women in the book. And there's really? a lot of other characters that are like minor that are also oh, okay. hostage. But, um, yeah. it's i on a sen- in a sense it's very there's all the stigma right behind the uh, notion of being a prostitute but it's also one of the more interesting ways to view the world from a character perspective and this from arathan who is like actually fairly young has is pretty he doesn't say it it's not it's well, raskan, raskan who right? says that yeah yeah but you get the idea right that <clears throat> maybe yeah. he's 14 and this is deep but this is actually pretty deep no 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 this is raskan i will accept all raskan's thoughts i will not accept arathan sitting and talking about grabbing sand and talking about right poor arathan i'll stop yeah mhm so anyway uh, finally arathan realizes that the way raskan is talking to him draconis is probably talking to feren at the same time and raskan says that once she gets pregnant she's going to just toss you aside so that you don't steal her child and she's going to leave you and arathan says no no i'm going to go live with her if she gets pregnant and and all that and <clears throat> raskan says that no draconis is not going to allow it uh, arathan is surprised like why i'm just a bastard son and right now i'm being thrown away somewhere why would he care and raskan says this can't continue because if it does draconis will kill feren and that will make arathan want to kill draconis and that is something draconis doesn't want so he's going to split them up so that nobody kills each other which it's like yeah yeah mental gymnastics i mean draconis is uh, very smart yeah he's he's an excellent father he is a very good leader he's um yeah yeah he is yeah yeah all that right and <laughs> and then uh, you know the best thing is raskan says that you just stop and think for a second that right now feren is not behaving like you she is not reacting in this hot headed manner she is listening calmly and she is going to listen to draconis and do what he says yeah. right yeah smart then they yeah. come back to camp and uh, who is left in camp the poor guy uh, rint <laughs> rint and feren are in the camp and 
uh, as soon as these two leave raskan and arathan feren knows that you know what's happening and raskan is calls her away and she tells rind the stew is cooking and there's not enough water it might start sticking you know keep a keep a watch on it yeah and then raskan takes her away he tells her to disarm remove all the weapons and she says no i'm not going to remove them and all of a second she is lying on the ground and she feels disoriented and he removes the weapons and throws them away do you have something to say uh beyond like <laughs> if you read this and you suppose it's someone who isn't a draconis in the scene it becomes so incredibly fucked up it probably wouldn't be written page i'm sorry what I... like if you take someone who isn't draconis and we like we don't know who this is the scene becomes very incredibly fucked up it still i don't know it is anyway, still fucked up but we know is, yeah, like, yeah. draconis has different intentions than what fairen might think but if we didn't know that this is fucked she even thinks that you know she even has a thought that yeah, if he's going to she does. the fucking guy just like slap her down to the ground and like took all her weapons away what do you think is going to happen <laughs> no but the thing is she doesn't feel any like him hitting her or anything it's just like magically she's on the ground i think that's the point that i would have noticed because she doesn't really see the attack or if he even attacks her she's just on the ground <clears throat> okay so and this is erickson's extremely favorite move people being dragged from place to place by holding their specific left ankle i can't get enough of this because any time <laughs> can do, do you have you noticed people being dragged like that everywhere on rack and trail right? because people are righties and you would drag someone from their left ankle if because would you really because you would want to keep your sword arm free when you're dragging something unless all these dragging people are all left handed and, and i mean you don't you even need... have to mention it i don't know why each time it mentions specifically that their left ankle is being dragged i haven't i have never noticed this so i mean first of all me. why the ankle and second of right. all why the left ankle so once you notice it you're not going to stop noticing it yeah okay <laughs> So anyway, he starts dragging her, and they reach a barrow in which there's a stone sarcoph sarcophagus. Please tell me how do you say that? Yeah, the sarcophagus. Sarcophagus. Is it which your language? The... Yes, and it means flesh eater. What? Yep. <laughs> yeah, phagus is like eating, right? Right, autophagy and all that. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, she's on the ground. He reaches over her and drags some dusty corpse out. it's a huge one with very thick bones and long black hair and one of its the corpse's bony hand is on her belly and she starts feeling intense pain right and she convulses so hard that she even knocks draconis off balance and he drops the corpse on her legs right and then he yells at her please you know just just run away and he seems to apologize to the corpse and calls her like begging forgiveness o queen yeah. or something blessings on you and begging forgiveness o queen yeah yeah Oh, you're just following along with the book in hand, is it? No, oh, that's nice. That's good because if I miss any quotes, you can just bring them up. So anyway, they get out, and Rakona says that you know it's because she is death, and you have life inside you. This is how pregnancy test is being done, and so now you are with child. And, yeah. And he says that you know leave my son alone. With this, she thinks that you know he might as well rape her because she feels that solid. And then she snaps back, saying that if you want him, just. take him come and get him or something and what has rin done in the camp he, he burned the fucking soup yeah <laughs> one job it's not enough water one job if there is not enough water it's not his fault yeah that's actually a good point because yeah yeah i forgot they didn't it's have draconis water is because fault. draconis it's is an idiot yeah. his fault <laughs> right I forgot about so, that Yeah, Good that's point. what I'm saying. That's the symbolism we are looking for here. So everything is ruined because one man couldn't calculate whether they, how much water they needed. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> anyway, uh, he's waiting for all these people to come back, and then he thinks that if his sister is hurt, then the entire border swords are going to rise up against the consort Draconis. So Arthur and Raskan come back first, and uh, <laughs> Arthur declares that. Uh, they're not afraid of his father him and feren obviously they're not afraid of him 
and for some reason i'm i've just written the quote here i don't know who this is i think this is rent thinking saying something like two lovers in the night could unleash a war and take down an entire realm they could Ooh. never see past each other they never did that's yeah. rent thinking yep mm-hmm. yeah so anyway arthan uh, is about to you know go searching for fenan and rent stops him to ask him a nice question about sacrifice did your tutor ever teach you what is sacrifice it means yielding your wants in the name of peace and this is something that marks you from growing from childhood to adulthood which is i mean couldn't they just hire rent to be his tutor instead of this sagander and he even says that you know he's left behind his wife and family back in raven keep and raskan says that you know if he had known that he had a family he wouldn't have why 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 what famous it's you yeah, know never mind just hear him <clears throat> okay this this can get pretty frustrating to people like me who are who don't know what you what you're trying to say yeah okay I, he's a border sort of a family and he's a waiting child and no i've read i've read erickson before i don't know you have <laughs> what i is this something for discussion yes okay just just make a note then please yeah yeah sure so anyway uh raskan say something like you know if i had known this i would have hired a different set of border swords and rent is saying mm-hmm. you know he's quite happy to be here because he once had an uncle whose wife like knifed him during labor oh yeah that's a great yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing yeah <laughs> and apparently he just pulled the knife out and kept you know uh, being being with the wife during labor so which this is amazing and then feran returns first she returns alone and uh, the first thing she does is scolds him for burning the stew and reconnaissance is back because he's uh, i mean he's behind because he's making propitiation. some kind of yeah propitiations in the barrow right and she ignores arathan completely and later that night he tries going to her and she says it's finished obviously it's finished then he cries and he becomes even more mad with his at his father who seems to have power over everything and finally what does he do throws away the weights which he was carrying all the way from his house yeah yeah oh my god oh this book is so amazing if you think about it so uh we cut to grizen fall who has caught a rabbit and he's cooking and eating it and do you know how he catches it not like with bow yeah. and arrow or anything it's it's uh, so he just runs it down what what kind of <laughs> anyway he uh, he's this his basically too gentle <clears throat> actually he's noticed will and galak riding in the distance trying to catch up with the other party but they didn't seem to have any curiosity in seeing him or meeting him and because you know he wonders that uh, you know that such shattered minds who are uncurious and he wonders if maybe one day the world will be filled with people like that like where a hearty laugh is met with frowns and all that so anyway he is if nothing else he as a protector he is against serious people and so he is relaxing he is eating his rabbit and then he sees uh, some lone walker coming from the east this section i have sort of just compressed the whole thing down this next section but the, the discussions that he has with caledon brood because there is so much banter here and it's it's just good fun but i don't think it goes anywhere so anyway just bear with me uh so he see, he feels caledon walking him walking in yeah can i just like share a quote from this yeah um so yeah caledon goes like um i have come from a place of tribulation and a dire portent did you raid a in wine leaving, cupboard did you by chance raid a wine cupboard yeah it's just like <laughs> and he did the point is he did he did have wine with him that's the whole point <laughs> caledon brood i would kiss you if i were blind and only a smidgen more desperate than i am yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway okay wait wait we're still getting a run down here caledon is walking in from the east and from the west he can f- feel you know disturbance of this telakai queen who even after this placation she is still in a sour mood and finally he meets <laughs> yeah this whole thing happens sorry sorry but i just want to hear lyra like the corpse is in a sour mood it's it's not a corpse it's a telakai queen it's not a corpse <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what? We have rarely seen sour mood corpses, if you think about it. Right? Like, well, the only one I can think of was that Thorpe had raced. <laughs> like... Raced is not a corpse. I think we've been through this before. He's not Undead. a corpse. He's dead, though. Is he? Is he really? Yeah, he is. In gardens, is he mentioned like he's undead? I think I so. I he was just... He was just enslaved. I don't think he was like... But anyway, the point is like... Yeah, the one. corpse is in a sour mood. And they're just quite hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, uh, now... Kaladan and Grizzin meet. And he has some jugs of wine. And they're all very happy. I, I've just mentioned this as they rip each other back and forth about Kaladan I, uh, sort of hanging out with Kilmandaros and all that. So anyway, now Kaladan comes to the actual point that his freedom has been wrested from him. Do you have any gold quotes there? Please go on because that is full of fun things between those two. Yeah, upon my tongue's wife, the shock of quality, she'll know not what to make of it. <laughs> So confesses her husband of centuries. Yeah. And yeah. because she finishes it, they, because they finished the wine, she's never going to meet see quality again. So anyway, Kaladan says that his freedom has been taken away from him. Uh, right? Yeah. And then Grizzin says that freedom is nothing but an irresponsible life. We yearn for it, but it is as short-lived as, uh, you know, I don't know why always the word used is shudders in bed. So that's what he says, that freedom is as short-lived as that. And Kaladin says that, you know, the first son of darkness has bound me to a blood oath. And Grisin says it's not going to last. And immediately says, yeah, I was trying to comfort you by lying. It might last. Who knows? So anyway, he says that he's <laughs> off to see the gardens of this dark woman, Mother Dark. And Kaladin says that Draconis might not like it if he goes to see her. But <laughs> but this is nothing to worry because Grizzin has seen that Draconis is far behind him. And anyway, Kaladin is surprised that, you know, Draconis has come to the Azadana lands, especially when the tensions at Karkanas are so high. And Grizzin says he he's coming there to hide his bastard son. And Kaladin thinks that maybe there is more to that than just hiding Arathan. And then <clears throat> Kaladin says that the ties to give... Do you think this is for us? He says that the ties give too much importance to gestures and the form of <laughs> maze of meanings. It says. But Grizzin yeah. fears no maze because he runs with hairs. Uh, anyway, he uh, asks if Mother Dark would be given a choice. Okay. In the wedding on. of, uh, you know, if she will be given a choice in the weeding of her garden because that's what Grizzin is offering to do. And this is when we get a description of Grizzin Pal. As... By the way, like, um, Weeding her garden is a euphemism for killing everyone who doesn't agree with her. Is it, sir? Is that? I mean, basically, no. Oh, I, I don't know. Because we've been talking about her gardens and then weeding and talking about draconis might not allow it. I, I did not even think of any other euphemism. This one. So anyway, I don't know why we get, get such detailed, loving descriptions of Grizzle. Because again, we see that he has golden hair, dancing eyes. And by the way, Grizzin is a death and I can change his, his, his appearance whenever he is wants. Is it like hard to change appearances because they seem to like stick to one look. They, f- they find one look and they just stay in it for like centuries. Unless like it's Triss. Like male. Hmm? Triss, Triss, Triss is different, yeah. Like male, you see him as this blue pot bullied guy in the prologue. And then all of a sudden he is bug. I don't know. They, they t- it takes time, maybe. Maybe it's a big process to change their appearance. So, anyway, I mean, he if, says... Oh, well, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Grizzin says that if anyone stands too close to him, they would just swoon into his arms. And then they open the last third bottle of wine. <laughs> and Kaladin says that he knows nothing about a rake. And Grizzin says, yeah, don't worry. I'm going there. I'll find out everything about him and tell you. And Kaladin thinks that he saw a sort of surety in him, in rake. Someone who is violent, but who is not easy with the violence in him. And he says that Rake has vowed that he will not drag Kaladan into their civil war. And Grisin asks if, you know, is this civil war actually inevitable? And he says, you know, this, this is a generation that has tasted blood. So there is going to be civil war. And mm-hmm. Grisin thinks that the Jagat had the right idea. You know, because in society we find seeds of its own destruction. 
and canada says no no it's the absence of society that leads to destruction because then they stop seeing each other as kin and all manner of atrocities are now possible yeah please or oh, is it you just wanted to find glorious fanboy. glorious yeah. yeah and then grizin says you know if mother dark wants this kind of dissolution uh, but nobody knows because because she's in darkness right and grizin asks yeah if caladan is like returning home but he's not krul are we are very careful with the pronouns here krul has not has had a child and the earth still holds the memory of the birth cry and he asks if he's going to go and drink krul's blood i i could just hear krul in the voice you were making yesterday in the oh krul yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. so brute says that you know there is no need for that the child is born and now the child is going to have more children and all that so maybe they initially think that draconis is going in a hurry to that land because he was angry with what krul has done but he mm-hmm. seems indifferent to it and what drives him is something else something more desperate and caradan thinks that yeah love is going to do that to you and <laughs> grizzin thinks the opposite way like you know like fleeing from <laughs> from his wife and children because kilmanoras has sent him out of the house and what followed him out of the house was a pot <laughs> <laughs> i don't know this chapter is pots and ladles you know if it had a name anyway uh, kilmanoras long ago has forsworn all weapons but the only two weapons she now carries are no no her fists no fists are one weapon and her temper is the other one <laughs> oh of course <laughs> yeah of course uh the basically the fight was because uh, grizen has had enough and thrown their child out sechul do you say sechul or sechul na no, sechul because it's sech thanks so sech yeah yeah, yeah. Good, good so he's thrown out sechul who has you know become come totally under the influence of his older half brother erastus <clears throat> because of that he's, uh, he throw the through the boy out and kilmander is through grizen out he <laughs> thinks that yeah what <laughs> I don't know. I find it like very weirdly fitting that like we have to follow us as a my family stories in order to understand what the fuck is going on with the dice. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Grizzin thinks that you know both these children are so weak and that makes his sack shrink in horror and Caladan says please rectify this before you meet mother dark but maybe it doesn't matter because anyway it's going to be so dark. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh best selling author everyone. <laughs> Now you know why. <laughs> okay, we have to stop laughing because this next scene is is disgusting. So, <clears throat> no more laughing. It's all it all goes down from here. Yeah. So, Sechul and Erastus, do you know what they've been up to? So, murder for fun. Sech feels guilty at the end. but as rest of things oh this is sort of exciting let's do more <laughs> you shouldn't laugh <laughs> we we asked this man if rastas is like meant to be pitied and he was like yeah man, i mean sure it's a valid no, dream no, no, like, we didn't ask him about rastas no no i was only talking about the book of the fallen guy i'm i they just share names this is what i've realized oh oh no no not just rastas and erent everyone from scavendaris to right. silkas ruin everybody right. it's just the names right. would you agree serap that's i mean serap? yeah i mean they just share names they don't yes. they're not the same person it's a it's a different world <clears throat> anyway because you finished the chapter and i'm just summarizing i'm not going section by section so what has happened is these two have lured karish wife of hood who is also hood is basically hout's brother and they have taken her to this place called the spar of andy and you know they don't, they don't like the name because how did the tice just claim this place yeah you know that's true it's a good point <clears throat> yeah so and they have taken her and murdered her there so that her blood flows along this path of jewels 
and at the same time they mentioned that her taste blood flows through and for a second i was thinking that is karish taste did food marry a taste don't laugh it's it's a valid thing because we see her blood flowing and then this guy says this taste blood flows through it's basically korea korea is able to follow the trail correctly and reach them because she's able to follow the route so karish's blood also has power which is surprising to sechul and then that's when we are told that azat and i are not the only elemental forces does the word elemental forces remind you of someone i mean i know who you mean like yeah, yeah. tetrarch and yeah okay yeah that's what just said to give me the answer and we'll keep moving so anyway sechul worries that this place is you know it's not for them and erastus is mad that you know mother dark has even tried to claim this place and all they want to do is undermine krul who just wants to give power to anybody who wants to take it and for this they want to draw mother dark into the into their fight and show her how much of a threat these new warrens are and so that she can resist krul and when they are both distracted with each other these guys will swoop in and do their plans whatever their plans are and says will says you know this plan is not subtle and i'll just you can do the quote I yield the meaningless secrets. Do you have it in hand? I yield the meaningless secrets, Sedge, to better hold hidden the important ones. Think of prod and pull, if you like. Explore the concepts in your mind and muse on the pleasures of misdirection. Are you I... truly as clever as you think you are? Oh, Sedge, it hardly matters. The suspicion is enough, making fecund the soil of imagination. Let others fill the gaps in my cleverness and make of, them, and make of me in their eyes a genius. I doubt the veracity of your words. Well, you should. <laughs> now you now help me out. We must leave. So, um, no. uh, a few yeah, things. Yeah. What I think you mean here is Bird and Paul, which, yeah, we know the... Right? Is that what you mean? No, no, I was going to say that it's just Erickson telling us that he's yielding the meaningless secrets oh. so that he's holding back the important ones and so that we can be misdirected and... knowingly misdirected and that that's mm. the bit i was going for yeah right. tell me about prod and pull because well i mean we know from the spoilers the, no 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 we know from the book of the fallen like the open oh. eye are such as kids so yeah that's that's one the other is basically such calls or asses an idiot to his face I'm like yeah maybe you're right but others will think i'm not an idiot which is um precisely how i expect galan would treat someone like arastas you know like he thinks he's so smart but he would have others think that he is smart but in truth he's an idiot <laughs> okay oh yeah i have written that notes such so wonders if erastus is all that clever and all that yeah anyway so they live in a hurry and how do they leave they unironically uses the same power which was granted by cruel's blood and this is when uh, such I has i like in the irony such has yeah. this Uh, sorry, 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 come on. I, I didn't get you. <laughs> I'm just like quoting Erastus, you know, he, he delights in the irony of using uh, Krull's blood uh, to make good his escape and shit. Yeah, yeah. I think we should put away the book because... <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of quotes here. Yeah, it, it's an amazing chapter. Anyway, Sitch has this moment of guilt and then they leave. Uh, all of a sudden, when they're walking out in Korea... Uh, Korea, uh, Korea is pretty exhausted, but how to start sensing something? And then he asks if she has understood the meaning of this trail of gems. And she says, maybe this is just to show us that, you know, what is at the end is a real treasure. It's not like the re- real treasure is not the friends you make along the way. It's a treasure. If, it's the corpse you find at the end of the trail. It's, See? Yeah. And anyway, he says the Azat and I are like curi- very curious creatures and they have a protector who protects nothing. then she starts saying that maybe what he protects are the things that cannot be seen like love and how it says oh this this part i really like it's like extremely simplified explain like i'm five type of philosophy which which just gets me and then how it says something like you know uh, you can give gifts to people and show that you love them and she says no no that those are just symbols because even if you take away the symbols the the emotion remains the same right so love remains and then she says maybe he's trying to protect trust and he says she noted by the way that Corey is like 17 in this chapter and like he's asking her like deep philosophical questions it's, about the material it's a socratic method of teaching her how to, to think about these things and it's pretty it good is. do not criticize this scene this is very good 
I mean, feel free, but do it later on because I'm just enjoying <laughs> it. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Anyway, uh, then he says something about trust and he say, uh, you know, he thinks that trust is almost like a transaction. You do this for me and I expect you to, uh, and I expect to return the favor or something. And she again says, no, no, that is again a symbol. A symbol can only stand in for the virtue. It is not a virtue itself. Then what is wealth a symbol of? And she says that, you know, it symbolizes greed, which is not a virtue. And he agrees that, you know, she's able to differentiate between a symbol uh, from the meaning. And then you know, she should not pretend to conflate the two because that is quite common. Anyway, uh, so Korea says that what the protector does is protect the distinction. And all of a sudden, their conversation ends very sadly because Hout notices something at his feet. There is a small crooked stream, almost black in color. And they follow this and find dead Garish with a long knife through her chest. And Hout, for the first time, we see a jagged, like staggering with emotion. And Korea sees that, you know, the, the woman has died like just moments ago. And she asks, like, where are the killers? We didn't see anybody coming up this trail. And then she looks into the chaos, you know, probably to look for the killers. And Hout says, you know, don't look into it because to look upon chaos is to yield to it. And he says that apparently he has heard that when Mother Dar came to this place, she did not even hesitate. She just leapt into the wild realm and returned as a changed woman. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're just going to. This is what happened. She then she returned as a changed woman, and he says that it was unwise of her to make of herself a symbol, Mother Dark, and because now people have started coveting the symbol and not the meaning. And Korea asks about Karish, who was apparently the greatest jagged scholar, and she has been killed by the Azathnai. And Korea wants to know if there is going to be war between the Azathnai and the jagged, which makes sense. He just blandly repeats the word war. And doesn't have much of a response. And then she asks, like, you know, you said that we have been invited here. And uh, how it says that this place is called a sparrow fanny, which is a fist of darkness. So now what we have to do is make sense of all the symbols here. And he almost, you know, asks her in a begging voice, like, Korea Delath, will you help us? And thus ends the chapter. Do you have anything more to add? Not really. Yeah. Um, I mean, beyond my <laughs> goddamn, but um, yeah, yeah, we move on to the that discussion. Was a chapter. There's a two chapters, amazing. Oh, there were two chapters, yeah, good point. So, uh, each of them took like 45 minutes to summarize, so <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. I mean, the page count remains the same, I feel. Maybe <clears throat> we're just becoming bad summarizers because. Maybe. And we're just bringing up all the quotes. Right. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for yeah. your time. Thank you, Maura. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. And, and if anyone's um, listening, good night. Good night. And hopefully you can join us for the discussion episode. Spoilers all. Yeah.